great to see you on this sunny day before the storm hits. I'd like to invite you to look at your insert because announcements are on there as well as on the screen. Coming up, we have an Advent Bible study beginning this Thursday at 10 o'clock. We're going to be reading about the redemption of Scrooge from the story of A Christmas Carol. And then on uh, next Saturday is our parade. I believe we have a, a nice rock and roll entry for the parade. And then next Sunday is the uh, finance committee at, after worship as soon as we can gather together. Are there other announcements? Okay, now are there joys or concerns? Yes. Oh, great. That's good news, isn't it? All right. Yeah. Okay, well, good luck with that. We hope you can get them. Yeah. Anyone else? My friend from college, Margaret Frieda. Margaret? Frieda, F-R-E-D-A. Okay, Margaret Frieda. Karen? And we have Susan back. Susan's back as a joy, yes. And uh, David, how is he doing? Charlie? I guess he's doing okay. I haven't gotten in touch with him during the week. Okay, all right. Karen? Martha. Martha. That's okay. <laughs> I knew that. The family of Bill Thing. Bill family of Bill, what was the last name? Thing, T-H-Y-N-G. For the family of Bill Thing, okay. Sharon, uh, my friend's friend is still doing badly and um, he needs prayer. He's got cancer in his head and in his neck and going down the back of his neck and it doesn't look very good. Is that Gary Martino? Gary Martino, okay. Um, I also have on our prayer list Ryan Minter, Stephen Evelyn Gray, and Elmer Pease. Anybody know about that? His family. His family? Yeah. Family. All right. Um, we'll keep those in mind when it's time for our prayers. Downstairs, as you go into the fellowship hall on the, on the first table, as you come to, you will see a bunch of these little blue angels with names on them and a, a name of a gift. These are for the Dover Children's Home in Dover. And uh, these are teenagers that are troubled teenagers, I believe. And so they have a wish list and the, the, name, the gifts that are listed on here are the things they specifically wished for. So if you pick up an angel, be sure to sign your name on the list beside the, the angels so that we know who picked up, say, Hunter's name and uh, put your name beside Hunter's name and the gift that he wished for, okay? I think it's pretty self-explanatory down there. So we hope we can, you don't, if we don't get them all taken, that's fine. We just need to know which ones are taken so that we can let the home know that the others did not get handed out. And we need them by next Monday, so bring them back next Sunday or Monday to the church somehow, but we'll get them over there. Any other announcements? Okay, today's service is a very different kind of service. We're doing the first for the first time, since I've been here anyway, uh, a Hanging of the Greens worship service. So uh, let us begin with our call to worship. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, the King? With the branches of cedar. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, the eternal Christ? With the of pine and pearls, whose leaves are ever living, ever green. How shall we prepare this house for the coming of Jesus, our Savior? With wreaths of folly and ivy, symbolizing his passion, death, and resurrection. How shall we prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus, the Son of God? By hearing again the words of the prophets who are told the saving word of God. 
For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Glory to God in the highest. And our opening hymn is People Look East. First two verses, two verses, one and two. Knows no beginning or ending. 
There is also symbolism in the colors of the Advent wreath, candles. While purple is still used in many churches and in our church, many Christian churches are now using blue to speak of the kinship, kingship of Christ. So three purple candles symbolize the coming of Christ from the royal line of David. He is coming as King of Kings as well as the Prince of Peace. The rose candle is always lit on the third Sunday of the Advent season, and that Sunday is specified as joy. The large white candle in the center is known as the Christ candle and points to Jesus the Christ, the light of the world. And now we will have the lighting of the Advent wreath by this Paneer family. And the order is on the screen and also on the back of your insert. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of Hope. Our hope is in God and in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all things. He is the one through whom God has promised to save and redeem His people. We light this candle today to remind us that He is our hope and the hope of the world. We thank God for the promise He has made to us and for the light He has brought into the world. Let us pray. O God, O Lord, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray you to send your light into our hearts at this time. Help us to be ready for the day and the hour of our final appearing. Live in us and help us live in you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, transform us so that our worship, our celebration,
There was a candy maker in Indiana who wanted, and gave for Indiana, <laughs> that's my home state, uh, who wanted to make a candy that would be a witness, so he made a Christmas candy cane. He incorporated several symbols for the birth, ministry, and death of Jesus Christ. He began with a stick of pure white, hard candy. White symbolizes the virgin birth and the sinless nature of Jesus. And hardness symbolizes the solid rock, the foundation of the church and the firmness of the promises of God. The candy, made, the candy maker made the candy in the form of a J. Can you make a J out of that? Yeah, there you go, upside down. To represent the precious name of Jesus, who came to earth as our Savior. It could also represent the staff of a good shepherd. So if you turn it over, it's like a staff. With, with which he reaches down into the ditches of the world to lift out the fallen lambs who, like sheep, have all gone astray. Thinking that the candy was somewhat plain, being just white, the candy maker stained it with red stripes. He used three small stripes to show the stripes of the scourging Jesus received when he was, before he was crucified, and by which we were healed, by his stripes we are healed. The large red stripe, can you see the three, the three little ones and three big large ones, yep. Yeah. The large red stripe was for the blood shed by Christ on the cross so that we could have the promise of eternal life. Unfortunately, the cross became known, a candy became known as a candy cane, a meaningless decoration seen at Christmas time. But the meaning is still there for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. So I pray that when you see a candy cane now, that you will... Uh, Remember that it's used to witness to the wonder of Jesus and his great love that came down at Christmas and remains the ultimate and dominant force in the universe today. Thank you. Now don't eat that unless your mother said you can, okay? <laughs> no, you can keep it. You don't want it? <laughs> Cedar, cedar. In ancient times, the cedar tree was revered as the tree of excellence and endurance. It also signified immortality and was used for purification. We place the cedar branches as a sign of Christ and of the kind of power he wielded. Not the power of might, but the power of transformation. As we contemplate his call to justice and peace, we seek to purify our hearts and renew a right spirit within us. And now let us remain seated as we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
announces the reign of the Messiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace to the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. May God bless the reading of this scripture. The significance of every reading. Because the needles of the pine and fir trees do not die each season like the leaves of most trees, the ancients saw them as symbols of things that last forever. In the scripture passage just read, the prophet Isaiah tells us that there will be no end to the reign of the Messiah. And so we hang wreaths from our balcony that are shaped in a circle, which itself has no end to signify the eternal kingdom of Jesus, the Christ. And now we will have our choir in.
to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. May God bless the reading of this scripture. Because this is the scripture that Jesus read at the beginning of his ministry in the synagogue of Nazareth, and which he applied to himself, we cannot hear these words from Isaiah without thinking of the healing that the coming of Christ will bring. The Gevergreen most associated with healing properties in the ancient world was the mistletoe. It was called the All Healer. People thought its special powers came from the lightning bolt that fixed it high up in the tree, and therefore they believed it came, as did the lightning, from heaven itself. This healing power was not only for physical ailments, but for the healing of relationships as well. It is said that in one town in medieval England, a bough of mistletoe was brought in and put on the altar, and the priest then declared a pardon for all sins. Originally, the kiss under the mistletoe was thought to have been the kiss of peace, symbolizing reconciliation, not the romantic kiss of a man and a woman. It is in keeping with the more ancient meaning that we decorate this sanctuary with mistletoe in anticipation of the coming of the healing presence of Jesus the Christ. And we hang the mistletoe in the entrance to our church. And let us sing the third verse of Joy to the World. <coughs> believed that hanging holly in their shelters would bring them good fortune. They also believed its mysterious powers would chase away witches and evil spirits. 
Early Christians wore holly as they entered the church, convinced that this would give them supernatural powers. The holly was also considered the symbol of Christ's passion. Many believe that Jesus' crown of thorns was fashioned from holly leaves, and that after the crown was placed upon his head, his the blood turned uh, his blood turned the white berries to the red berries that we see today. The bitter bark suggested the drink offered to Jesus on the cross. Holly was so revered for its ability to defy death. It is said that wherever Jesus walked upon the earth, holly sprang up in his footsteps. Ivy, too, is rich in symbolism. In Middle Ages, <coughs> ivy was used extensively for Christmas decorations. It was considered a symbol of love because of its clinging habit of growth. Holly and ivy are often associated together in legends because of the holly's sturdiness and the ivy's tenaciousness. Both have the incredible ability to survive and grow. We, we decorate our sanctuary with holly and ivy because of their link through the ages with beauty, endurance, and permanence. And though they are steeped in legend and superstition, their quality of life over death is fitting and proper for the birth of the one who offers each of us life beyond death. And I know this is not in your hymn books, but you may know the song, The Holly and the Ivy.
the significance of the poinsettia. The most popular flower of the Advent Christmas season is the bright red poinsettia. Actually, the red petals are not blossoms, but leaves. The blossoms are the small yellow clusters found at the center. Somehow, the red and green leaves of the plant give to Christmas an added touch that would not be the same without them. This attractive flower was discovered growing wild in Mexico by Dr. Joel, Joel Poinsett, who served as our first foreign minister to that country from 1825 to... to can't be right, 1829. In Mexico, the plant was referred to as the flower of the holy night, or the flame leaf. Many legends have grown up around the poinsettia. One is that it is merely a weed that grew in Mexico until it was placed at the feet of the Virgin Mary by a poor peasant girl who had no other gift to bring. As it touched the feet of the statue, it was transformed immediately into a flower of scarlet brilliance. Another legend states that the blood fell from the broken heart of a young Mexican girl, and a poinsettia grew up where each teardrop fell. This beautiful flower speaks to us symbolically in several ways. First of all, the star-shaped formation of the red leaves called to mind the star, which shone for the wise men. In a less joyous sense, the color of the flower is blood red, symbolizing the fact that the baby of Bethlehem's manger became the savior of the world as he shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary. And now we decorate our sanctuary with poinsettias. And we will sing like a child. children of God who were born not of blood of the will of the flesh or of the will of man but of God and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory 
the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. May God bless the reading from this gospel. The significance of the Christmas tree. The evergreen tree has been a symbol for Christmas and the center of holiday festivals for many years. The green color of the tree symbolizes growth. It also represents everlasting life in the midst of winter. It is hard to tell just when the use of the Christmas tree at the Christmas season began. However, it was probably first used in Scandinavia. Records tell of its use there in the 8th century when St. Boniface persuaded the Druids to replace the oak tree of their pagan ceremonies with a fir tree that symbolized life. Listen to the legend of the first Christmas tree. 700 years after the birth of Christ, Pope Gregory wanted to send a Christian missionary to pagan tribes of northern Germany. He called on Winifred of England, also known as St. Boniface, to go to Germany for a three-year period to teach Christian ways to the pagan tribes who lived there. One day, as Winifred was traveling among the people, he came upon a gathering for a pagan ceremony in the forest. With the ritual about to take place, the spirit of the forest was being worshipped with a human sacrifice. The usual ceremony involved the blood of an innocent child sprinkled around an oak tree to please the god of the forest. Winifred begged that the ceremony be stopped, but his words were ignored. In a desperate act to stop the ritual, Winifred grabbed the ceremonial axe and cut down the oak tree. The people were furious, but their anger turned to amazement as they saw a small fir tree spring up to replace the fallen oak. A shaft of light caused each twig on the fir tree to glisten, and the people listened and believed when Winifred told them that the tree was the symbol of the birth of life through Christ. And thus the first Christmas tree came to Germany. Now that's one story, but another story is probably more familiar, uh, and that is the story about Martin Luther King, I mean Martin Luther, period. 700 years later, 700 years later, the story goes that as Luther walked in the forest one starry night with snow covering the ground, he marveled at the beauty of the starlight as it shone upon the branches of the fir trees. When he tried to tell his family of the glory and beauty of the forest, they failed to comprehend what he had seen. So he, bought, he brought a pine tree into the house and placed candles upon it to represent the twinkling of the stars. The earliest use of the Christmas tree in America is also not known for sure. However, a German tailor, August Imgard, set up a fir tree in his house in Wooster, Ohio in 1847 and decorated it. The first tree to appear in a church was in Cleveland, Ohio in 1851. Some members of the congregation thought the act was sacrilegious and were very critical of their pastor. Few trees appeared in churches in the mid-19th century, since many still considered it to be a pagan custom. However, the tree now has become a symbol of the glory of God and the promise of eternal life. As we prepare for the coming of Christ, the light of the world, we light this Christmas tree. And in this time of Advent, whenever you see a lighted tree, let it call to mind the one who brings light to our darkness, healing to our brokenness, and peace to all who receive him. May this tree, arrayed in beauty and splendor, remind us of the life-giving cross of Christ, that we may always rejoice in the new life that shines in our hearts. Let us be in prayer. Lord of hope, you bless our lives every day. We sometimes forget that all those blessings come from you, and we overlook them 
or decide that we just deserve all the wonderful things that come our way. It seems that every year the push for the commercial holiday expectations comes earlier and earlier. And by the time we approach the true holy day, many of us are exhausted. We cannot gather the strength to praise you. Make us ready, O oh Lord. Slow us down and help us find release from the demands. Enable us to make decisions that will build hope and community rather than foster greed and selfishness. Help us reach out to others with gifts of kindness and peace. And help us to remember those who are less fortunate and are troubled. Especially today, we pray for Ryan Mentor, for Steve and Alan Gray, Gary Martino, and the family of Elmer Pease and Bill Thing. We give you thanks, O Lord, that Olin is doing well and that Susan is back with us today. We pray that you will help Deb to receive her hearing aids, and we pray for Margaret Frieda and her need. Enter our hearts, O God, not with demands, but with a gentle reminder of the hope and peace you bring. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now receive our morning offering. Will the ushers please come forward?
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart with the mouth of the Lord. It is right to lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give them thanks and praise. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looks for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, for God of our and earth, Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts, and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones, and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things, and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant, to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer of our Lord Thomas. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we are one body, for we are many. For we all partake in the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is the sharing of the blood of Christ. All are welcome at our Lord's table. I would invite uh, Mary, who's going to be helping me this morning, come forward. 
I invite you to come by the center aisle, receive the piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and return by the side aisle. <coughs> together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now let us close with a single song of Bethlehem verses 1 and 2.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let us join hands and make a circle and sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth.